Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, open this joint webinar uh, with uh, Diana and the FIB. My name is Denise Ferreira. Uh, I, uh, I'm a consultant at the Diana FEA uh, already for uh, seven years. And uh, before I did uh, research um, based on assessment of concrete infrastructure. And currently, uh, my main task is to take care of uh, all kinds of Diana documentation. So um, I and, uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar that puts uh, together uh, Professor Marco de Prisco and Pim van der Haar. Um, so today we are going to uh, talk about material characterization for steel fiber reinforced concrete. Uh, first, uh, we will have uh, the lecture from uh, Professor Marco Di Prisco. He will provide us a good background on the conceptual basis of constitutive models for this type of material with a focus on design methodologies. Um, after that, we will have my colleague Pim uh, from Diana FEA. Uh, Pim um, is a, a, a structural engineer uh, from the consultancy department um, at Diana. Uh, and uh, while well, he is used to uh, deal with large scale, real um, scale uh, finite element models, and uh, he's going to uh, talk about material characterization of steel fiber reinforced concrete for nonlinear finite element analysis. Um, so we will have these first two uh, lectures. Uh, and after the lectures, we will have some time uh, to answer your questions. Um, so please, during the presentations, uh, you can leave your questions in the QA box you will find um, in your Zoom. Uh, and at the end, uh, so we will reserve some time to address uh, these questions. Um, so having uh, said this, uh, so I want to uh, introduce Professor Marco Di Prisco. So Marco Di Prisco is a full professor uh, at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Politecnico di Milano, and he will uh, bring us the lecture on fiber reinforced concrete constitutive models for design. So the stage is yours, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to start uh, with this uh, lecture. This is a topic uh, very important in my opinion. Uh, today we will, I would like to speak about the constituent models for them. Uh, I will start and I will focus my attention on the uniaxial tension constituent models. Recently, we will introduce uh, um, probably in the next model code also the compress uniaxial compression. But uh, uh, I think that uh, due to the time that we have, uh, it's better to concentrate our attention on the uniaxial tension constitutive models. So I will start from some basic concept uh, and then passing from the classification, I would like to introduce the most uh, uh, used uh, um, design models. So the linear and the rigid plastic model. And uh, uh, then I try to explain uh, the key role of the structural characteristic lens to pass, to pass from uh, a stress uh, and uh, um, crack opening uh, to a stress strain, which uh, is uh, much more used in the design field from civil engineers. And uh, uh, I will also speak about the reliability of these design models, uh, profiting also of a case study and uh, um, the uh, mo modified and uh, much more sophisticated serviceability constitutive loads uh, that can be used uh, for structural analysis with the uh, finite um, I would start from this idea. If we extract just a simple fiber from a block of concrete uh, and we have different um, uh, specimen, obviously, always uh, we have a, a very important scattering because the pull-out mechanism uh, so the extraction of the fiber from the uh, concrete specimen uh, is due to bond. And that's the reason why we start, uh, even if the fiber is only 
in a precise uh, position due to the uh, difference in the embedment, uh, we have a, a scattering. So this is a very important feature of our machine. A uh, long time ago, in 94, Vantier Trottier uh, looked into uh, different type of fibers and um, showing a different pull-out test, uh, explained us that if you change the shape of the fiber, you could have a very different uh, um, carbs, uh, load versus sleep. And here you see some examples. And uh, look, uh, uh, theta and phi correspond to the angle respect to, uh, of the normal with respect to the crack plane, which is uh, x, y. And so you see that uh, the shape uh, uh, give us a different uh, curve, so a different uh, branch. Um, of course, uh, if we change also the inclination, so in this case, uh, for instance, uh, adopting different value of theta, uh, for the same type of fibers, you could have also different uh, uh, response in terms of load the sleep. That is a very important concept to uh, immediately understand. There is another concept which is important. We, we are speaking about random fibers. So if we have, for instance, a, a, a cubic decimeter of stiff fibers, um, and we have a mix with only 40 kilograms of stiff fibers, depending uh, on the uh, diameter and on the length of the fiber, we could have a very important uh, numbers passing from uh, around 169,000 uh, of fibers uh, for the largest fibers, so the, what we name uh, macro fibers, and uh, more than 19 million if we have uh, what we name a uh, micro fibers, so fibers with only a diameter of 16, uh, 160 micro. But of course, all these fibers cannot be concentrated in the blue uh, zone, but they have to be dispersed. So we need to produce a good country in order to disperse as the best uh, this, uh, uh, this fiber in the mix. When we look to the uniaxial tension test, the main evidence uh, when we have uh, a, uh, an average tension versus displacement is a uh, growing of a Q. And you can see in, the, uh, in this picture how if we pass from a plain concrete uh, where essentially at 200 microns we don't have any residual stress uh, to a material characterized by around 60 kilogram per cubic meter, which corresponds to a 0.8 uh, in terms of uh, percent, of course, in terms of uh, volume percentage, we have uh, the, a, a Q uh, after the uh, cracking and uh, uh, after the first branch is the post crack. So what we can uh, immediately understand is that uh, the pullout mechanism give us a cue after the crack. But this is seems uh, nothing uh, if we look in the uniaxial tension, but when we analyze the same material in, in, uh, in bending, for instance, we see with a huge difference between uh, a plain concrete, which is practically completely brittle, a material with only 30 kilograms of steel fibers, so 0.4% in terms of uh, volume percentage, and the material with 0.8%. So you see how in bending, due to the redistribution of the stresses in the cross section, you could have a very important contribution for fibers. This contribution uh, increases with the redundancy of the, um, of the structure. So if we have a plate which is a, a supported on the perimeter, and this is a circle plate, um, and we load uh, centrally, we will have uh, a classical uh, crack with uh, the formation of uh, two cracks uh, uh, along the diameter in a plain concrete and a very brittle material and a very brittle response. But if we pass to a fiber reinforced concrete, we have a huge increase and then also a quite significant ductility of the behavior. And the same when we pass to a, a, a plate, which is uh, supported on a different type of uh, uh, supports. Uh, here we see the difference between a plain concrete um, and uh, independently on the fact that we are on a sand or on a rubber. The rubber is in blue, the sand is in red. But uh, when uh, uh, we have uh, um, the continuous uh, support of a rubber over a sand, you can see that uh, the response change completely. So what is important to understand is that if we increase the redundancy of the structure, we can see immediately a, a very good uh, uh, behavior 
in terms of uh, um, bending, uh, and this uh, behavior grows uh, with uh, the increase of the uh, redundancy of the structure. Um, in order to characterize this material, after a, a long, dis long discussion in different committees, uh, um, it was decided that the best would be just uh, to have a free, a free point bending test on a notch cross section. And here you see the sides, it's essentially a, a square section uh, of 150 millimeter for side. And uh, uh, we have a notch of uh, 25 millimeter in the center. And in this case, uh, looking to the load versus uh, CMOD, so the crack mouth opening displacement measure and the bottom of the specimen, we could see uh, a, a, the force uh, which uh, uh, changed completely the behavior with respect to the plain concrete. In gray, you see the plain concrete response, and uh, in a continuous black line, you see what happens uh, when you have uh, uh, a, type, uh, a certain amount of fibers, around uh, 40 kilograms of fibers. So um, what happens? Uh, um, essentially, in order to compute this, we need to compute the flexural uh, residual strengths computed according to the classical um, modulus computed in elasticity. So we have to compute the bending moment. We have to divide for the uh, bending modulus. And uh, in this way, we characterize our material in three point as a cracking for a crack mouth opening displacement of 0 0.5 millimeter and for a, a CMOT uh, equal to 2.5 millimeter. Uh, as the cracking is good to know uh, in order to know the, the behavior uh, close to the cracking. Uh, for 0 0.5 means uh, something which, corre which is correlated to the serviceability in states. And finally, 2.5 is correlated to um, ultimate release state. Of course, uh, there, are, uh, there, is, uh, there is a need uh, to be careful in the preparation of the spacement. So in the EN 14651, uh, specify how to fill the formwork and also we have to rotate the, the uh, spacement in order to uh, uh, not risk uh, to have uh, to be affected too much by eventually the um, in a different density in the different layer of the spacement. And then we have to practice uh, a notch. And uh, um, you can have also in, in some laboratory which are not uh, uh, equipped by uh, 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 crack, uh, but by transducer uh, or clip gauge, uh, we can use even uh, a transducer for the deflection. So in the in the uh, EN fourteen six hundred fifty one, you have also a correlation between the, the crack mouth opening displacement and the deflection. Well, uh, in the uh, model code, but also now in the Euro code and Excel, we decided to have a classification which is based on the two main uh, values, the serviceability and the ultimate one, so FR1K and FR3K. And here you can see a, a table where you see um, essentially uh, the line, uh, the first line gives us the FR1K value. And then uh, uh, according to the different uh, uh, ratio between FR3K and uh, the FR1K, which correspond to the STEM classes, uh, we can have uh, um, uh, the value of FR3K. So looking, for instance, to this example, we have six spacemen. We know the nominal strengths computed as a bending moment divided for the uh, elastic uh, uh, bending modulus uh, versus CMOD. We uh, can compute for 0 0.5 and 2.5 the characteristic value according to the Eurocode zero. Um, so the log normal approach. And uh, then uh, we compute these two points uh, and we can compare with the strength classes. And in this case, we have a class 4C because uh, we have, uh, as you can see, um, a ratio between FR3K and uh, uh, class 4, which justifies the position of the uh, letter C. So 4C means uh, that I have a, a FR1K equal to 4 megapascal. And I have a FR3K, which is at least 0.9 FR1K, so around 3.6 megapascal. So this is uh, the classification we adopt. Of course, we need to pass uh, from a stress uh, crack opening to a stress strain. And this is a, very this is a very crucial point. So we need to introduce a characteristic structural lens. And generally, it is introduced as a minimum between the crack distance and the Y, which represents essentially the uh, 
A, the, the depth of the, of the uh, beam minus uh, the, the uh, value of the neutral axis. So uh, if uh, we have a neutral axis, which is very close to the upper bound, uh, we can confuse, uh, if you like, uh, the H and X with uh, the global depth of our cross-section. Of course, this is not valid for finite element approach because in that case, we don't use uh, the uh, plane section kinematic model. We use another type of uh, uh, model. And so uh, in the next lecture, you will go uh, uh, deeply in this problem because uh, uh, changing uh, uh, the, uh, the type of finite element, uh, we have also to change uh, the uh, characteristic structural lens, which essentially is a way to spread the crack opening in a, a different zone corresponding to the crack band. Uh, when uh, we compute uh, uh, the crack uh, uh, distance, uh, um, we have to take into account of two main contributions. Of course, in the equilibrium, we have to take into account the stress, uh, the residual stress on the cracked uh, uh, section. And uh, we have also to compute uh, the stress in the bar, which is changed due to the residual stress is uh, guaranteed by the presence of the fibers. And also, we could also evaluate a change in the uh, tangential uh, behavior, so the bond uh, uh, stress versus leap behavior of our bar. But usually, this uh, final contribution is neglected uh, to simplify the approach. Um, we have also to define an ultimate crack opening. And usually, the ultimate crack opening takes into account the minimum between two main request. One is a request in terms of ductility. So we start from a, a, the definition of a, a final strain of 2% for variable strain distribution along the cross section and 1% for a, a constant size strain distribution along the cross section. And this is a, a requirement uh, due to ductility. Then there is also a problem of uh, uh, a fiber geom uh, related to fiber geometry. So we know that if we exceed the 2.5 millimeter of crack mouth opening displacement, we could have a lot of problems for a lot of type uh, of fibers uh, that are sold uh, at the moment in the market. And that means that uh, it's better to close uh, at that value in order to be always on the safe side. Well, um, this is uh, important. This is, it's important to know that uh, even if uh, we accept the 2.5 millimeter as a final crack opening, uh, for many cases, uh, for uh, fibers uh, with uh, characterized by a, a lens which is uh, even uh, around uh, 30 millimeter, you could have uh, a value which is very close to zero for a, a crack opening which is uh, much smaller than 2.5 millimeter. Um, of course, uh, if we want to define uh, uh, the constitutive low uniaxial tension starting from bending, uh, we could uh, use uh, uh, for the identification uh, the classical equilibrium uh, relationship, uh, uh, imagining that uh, the strain obtained as a ratio between the crack opening and the characteristic structural lens uh, remain plane. This is the same concept adopted for reinforced concrete structure. And uh, if we use the two equilibrium uh, equation due to bend to rotation and uh, longitudinal uh, uh, direction and uh, the uh, strain, uh, the plane strain um, approach that corresponds to the Bernoulli essentially idea for a, a, a homogenized and diffused uh, um, uh, portion of, of our beam, uh, the portion between two cracks. In this situation, we can arrive uh, point by point to identify the constituting law. But this, uh, um, this way is uh, uh, very uh, expensive in terms of time and is not good for design. So what we did, uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, suggested essentially two simple models. One is rigid plastic. The other one is uh, um, uh, in the uh, post-peak behavior is linear. So it's uh, linear. That means uh, usually it's a softening, uh, linear softening, but sometimes for special material, we can arrive to have also a hardening behavior. And uh, we correlate uh, the um, value of the, uh, which ca characterize these uh, simple models, uh, FFTU and FFTS, uh, with uh, the uh, residual flexural strengths we have identified by means of uh, the bending, the three point bending test I presented before. And here you see the relationship. 
how we obtained this relationship? Always by means of equilibrium. But uh, uh, when we have these two uh, models, uh, we have to pass to the strain. And in order to pass to the strain, as I anticipated, we have to divide the crack opening for the characteristic structural lengths. So we arrive to introduce these two type of models, which are expressed in terms of stress strain. So are very, uh, if you like, familiar for a, for a conventional design. Now, in order to uh, correlate uh, the uh, constitutive low uniaxial tension to the residual bending strengths, which are nominal, of course, uh, we can uh, essentially produce uh, a, uh, for the rigid plastic model an equivalence in terms of uh, bending moment uh, uh, between uh, uh, these two uh, idealization of distribution of stresses along the cross section. And uh, uh, if for the linear model, uh, we need to assume the uh, linear strain behavior on the cross section. And then, uh, as usually, we have uh, uh, for the serviceability free unknowns, uh, that means the stress uh, on the top uh, in the concrete, uh, in the compressed concrete, uh, the FFTS. Uh, which correspond to the sort of elastoplastic behavior for serviceability region. And then uh, we can uh, um, use also equi rotational equilibrium and uh, translational equilibrium, and we arrive to define this value. And uh, when we have uh, to look to the ultimate limit state, we apply only the rotational equilibrium, and we can immediately uh, obtain the relationship between FFTU and uh, the two flexural strands, FR3 and FR1, identified by means of the N14651. OK, this uh, approach uh, can be explained by these two equations and this uh, assumption. What is very important to see is that uh, depending on the elastic model, so, so of the compressive strengths, you could have a different value of uh, the factor which correlate uh, the uh, flexural strengths FR1 to the KEA value, which corresponds essentially to the value in uh, for the crack mouth opening displacement of 0 0.5, what we name FFTS. But uh, uh, if uh, you look at the variations, they are not so huge. So usually we accept a constant value, which is equal to 0 0.37. And then uh, you can uh, also evaluate uh, uh, the KB, which corresponds to the value when the stress uh, is not equal to 0 0.5, but is equal to zero, and uh, uh, you can obtain this type of relationship. In the model code, we did uh, a, even a, a further simplification. So we imagine to be in the uh, smallest, uh, in the, if you like, uh, smallest class, so the class A. So the relationship between FR3 and FR1 is uh, 0 0.5, as you can see here. And, uh, at the end, you can obtain the KB value, so the value for the crack mouth for brain displacement equal to zero, uh, equal to 0 0.45. Well, uh, another concept which is very important for fiber and concrete is that uh, usually uh, we have also a, a difference between uh, uh, the behavior in the beam and the behavior in the plate. And you see that the behavior in the beam is much more, is uh, um, show us a much larger scatter than what we can have in a, in a real structure. That means that when you have uh, in a structure the possibility to have uh, different uh, resistance mechanisms working in parallel, you reduce uh, the global scatter of the response. And uh, for this reason, at the end, uh, we try to uh, adopt uh, in the final design expression a uh, two factor, uh, which is correlated to the orientation coefficient, the what we measure in and what we, what we can compute in the um, in the classical uh, EN 14651, uh, pardon. And uh, uh, the KG is another factor which essentially uh, give us the possibility to go from the characteristic value to the average value uh, because uh, we know that uh, for a redundant structure, we go towards that direction. And so at the end, uh, the two models uh, uh, introduce also these two factors, and we are right to define the design value by using both the factor and the classical safety coefficient, which is uh, considered equal to 1.5. Well, uh, we can check what we did. We can check by concrete uh, 
scoring on a pending specimen adopted for the uh, identification test. And here you can see what you can obtain passing from the constitutive model. This is a right uh, uh, straight line dashed and what you can obtain in a uniaxial tensile test. But uh, um, we can see also in bending, if we adopt uh, the assumptions that I already explained, uh, you can see that you cannot cover the crack zone, but you can cover the residual zone, which corresponds to what we are interested to, because we are interested to the behavior after the cracking. And uh, uh, what is very important, we are able also, with the introduction of the characteristic structural lens, uh, to have uh, a side effect behavior. So changing uh, the depth of the beam with the same constitutive law, you have uh, a, a, a final response which can be ductile for a very uh, small beam and uh, can be brittle for uh, very deep beams. Uh, the uh, structural characteristic lens can be also not homogeneous in the cross section. In that situation, you can have some red zone where the crack distance is uh, huge. And so, starting from the same stress crack opening, you have a different slope in. Uh, as a post peak in the for a linear uh, residual model. And uh, uh, you see the two zone uh, where the crack distance uh, uh, are different. And uh, uh, for the same constitutive law in, uh, identify, you have uh, two different uh, uh, constitutive law that uh, can be used in the same procession. Just to check the behavior, here you see a lot of different type of response uh, uh, of a beam, uh, yen 14.651. Uh, you see different color passing from the class uh, 1B to a class uh, uh, maximum class of 6C. For all these classes, if we try to uh, compute the safety coefficient of the bending moment uh, uh, for the ultimate crack opening uh, with all these uh, tests uh, that we have, you see that uh, usually. Uh, we have uh, the experimental value, of course, are the uh, red point. You see that always uh, you have a, a average uh, safety factor, which is very huge. And uh, uh, if uh, you look uh, to the characteristic value, uh, of course, uh, um, you progressively go towards uh, a, a reduction of the, uh, an increased pattern of the safety coefficient. The same happens for the maximum bending moment. And uh, uh, this is uh, very important to know. That means that uh, for our material, uh, looking to the maximum bending moment, not the, max the bending moment for the ultimate crack opening, you are always guarantee a very huge uh, safety coefficient uh, in the average. Now, looking to a, a, a real beam, uh, we used uh, for uh, a floor in a residential building. Uh, we uh, tested uh, according to the EN 14.651, we cast uh, uh, changing the casting direction to beams uh, characterized by 1.5 meter of uh, length and uh, 250 millimeter in depth and 500 millimeter in, in width. And uh, we obtain uh, the final response uh, uh, given in this uh, nominal strength versus code uh, uh, graph. And uh, um, with the help uh, of the uh, Barcelona group, uh, we uh, cored in different uh, position and uh, according to different uh, direction. And what we saw that uh, if we compare the uniaxial tensile test on the uh, spacing obtained by this coring, the double edge with splitting test and the double punch test, so different way to obtain the uniaxial tensile test, uh, uniaxial tensile response, we arrived uh, with different uh, area of uh, uh, material subjected to uniaxial tension compared to the conventional test used for the classification to these uh, results. So you see which is the difference uh, in the average between the three different uh, type of tests that uh, we can use uh, for verify the behavior of our material. They are not so different, especially in the second part we are interested to, related to the uh, to the pull-out mechanism. And uh, you see also that with the double edge and double punch, we can distinguish uh, the top from the bottom. And usually in the bottom, you have something more than in uh, the top, of course. 
And uh, um, we can also use a double age with splitting test uh, to evaluate the K0. And you can see the difference uh, if uh, we change uh, the, uh, apply the, the, the direction of the uniaxial uh, force. And uh, so this uh, express the difference uh, between uh, the different direction and this difference can be computed by means of the double age with splitting test. Looking to the uh, relationship with respect to the uh, constitutive law extracted by the uh, bending test, you can see that if you have this as an average value and you consider finally the characteristic or the design and you compare with this uh, uh, curves obtained as the average of this acceptance test, you are always on the safe side. Please remember that when we core a material, we lose the contribution of some fiber, which remains cut by the coating. We can also uh, evaluate by means of magnetic test the uh, direction of the fiber in the specimen and in the core. And finally, we can evaluate uh, the behavior with reference to the nominal strength uh, versus code uh, for these beams. And uh, from this, you can see that uh, if you look to the design value, which is a gray one, you have always a safety coefficient with respect to the two behavior of the beams uh, uh, obtained uh, changing the uh, casting position uh, always closer to more than two. And uh, in the model code, uh, we presented uh, a much more advanced constitutive models, uh, which are not the design one. These models uh, will be um, even, uh, if you like, uh, uh, for, uh, improved uh, by uh, considering uh, the case of the hardening material, but I don't insist on this concept because it will be the matter of the next lecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Marti Prisco, for this very interesting uh, presentation on the constitutive uh, side, side of this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, we will now continue with the next lecture uh, that is uh, Pim van der Haag. And he will bring us uh, some insights on the numerical simulation of fiber reinforced concrete with uh, finite element models and also application uh, to civil engineering practice. So I give you the word, Pim. Uh, thank you, Denise. Um, I think you can all see my screen, but uh, I will be the, discussing the uh, material char characterization of steel fiber reinforced concrete for uh, nonlinear finite element analysis. Um, basically, the presentation will be in, in, yeah, in two parts. Uh, the first part is the constitutive model. And then, it's, yeah, especially for nonlinear finite element analysis. And the second part is how to obtain uh, proper crack localization and uh, explain why it is important. And then uh, some uh, concluding remarks. Um, yeah, the first, uh, the first thing is the constitutive model, which is actually in the model code. And uh, this is just for, for plain concrete. Um, uh, what you see here is actually, uh, yeah, this in this case, it's uh, the, first, the left side describes the stress strain relation up till cracking and the right side describes the stress crack opening relationship. Um, what is important uh, to highlight here is actually the part which I would like to get into is the, the basically the pre-peak branch. So the, the branch between 0.9 uh, uh, FCTM and, uh, and, uh, and the tensile strength. Um, uh, why is this introduced? Yeah, the reason was to, to also uh, capture the micro cracking. Um, uh, but uh, what does this mean for, for nonlinear finite element analysis? Uh, we actually usually, in most cases, you model it with some sort of smeared crack approach. And in, in general, if you more already model it with a smeared crack approach, the micro cracking is already taken into account. Um, so when we look at nonlinear finite element analysis, I don't think there's any need for this, uh, for this branch. And I have an uh, example to, to show you this. Um, in the, uh, in the top picture, uh, you see actually some cracks. 
uh, in a finite element model. And this was modeled with a smeared track approach. And um, the blue circle highlights the macro crack. And what you see is that it just nicely follows the stress strain uh, diagram. But between the cracks, you can see the, the micro cracks. Um, and the micro cracks basically unloads at some moment. Um, and, and yeah, all this already basically shows that uh, micro of micro cracking is all also already in, uh, in the analysis. So there's no need to take that part into account. Um, I also did it uh, indeed without the small part. And, and then you uh, see indeed that it's nicely also introducing uh, the, the micro cracking, which is the, uh, the orange line. You can see it goes up to the peak, uh, small softening, and then it starts unloading. Uh, that's typically what we see with micro cracking. Um, so it's good to note that uh, you should not also use the uh, stress strain diagram in the previous slide because you actually introduce extra energy. Um, so the, 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 the energy dissipation in the, in the previous slide is actually higher uh, than the energy dissipation in, in this slide. So that means that, yeah, if you use uh, that strain, a stress strain relation that you're actually overshooting your capacity. Uh, um, so that's why we recommend for smeared crack approach, uh, not to use that uh, pre-peak range. Um, obviously for uh, a discrete cracking approach, where you only um, basically model the macro crack with, for example, an interface and the continuum elements around it are just a linear elastic material, then you're not capturing the micro cracking. Um, so if you model it like this, then you could consider using that, that, that sort of small uh, pre pre branch. Uh, but in general, uh, for nonlinear finite element analysis, we're using the smooth cracking approach then it's recommended not to use it. Um, if you now continue to the, uh, yeah, the stress strain relation, uh, which is in the, uh, uh, the model code, um, yeah, as, as it's basically built up uh, partly um, as plain concrete. So that the first branch uh, up to A, B, C, and then Q is just plain concrete. So as discussed before, uh, yeah, we recommend not to include the AB branch. Uh, the other thing we would like, yeah, what, what I would like to talk about is the branch between C and D. Um, so first maybe good to, yeah. Um, Professor De Prisco already explained what point D is and what point E is, but point D is indeed uh, where the C, C mod is uh, 0 0.5 millimeters and Point E is uh, where the CMOT is 2.5 uh, uh, millimeters. Um, and to calculate point C, it's basically an extrapolation of point D and E. Um, but what you're also saying is actually that um, once the cracking starts, that we already have a full strength of our steel fibers. Um, and if you look at uh, some experimental tests, for example, for the hooked end fiber, uh, which is also uh, widely used, you can see uh, that we need to, uh, th th that some slippage of the fiber is required to get full strength. So in this example, or in this experimental test, you could see the peak is around one millimeter. So uh, in order to reach the, the maximum strength of our fiber, you need at least uh, yeah, around one millimeter in this example. Of course, there are other fibers uh, which have a different behavior and could be uh, yeah, maybe uh, yeah, uh, have a peak uh, a lot higher or, or at least quicker so that um, a smaller slip is required to reach your maximum uh, force. However, in this case, uh, I just uh, had a look at the hook it end fiber. Um, so what we did next is actually just, uh, yeah, more or less summarize the, the softening behavior of the concrete, which is, 
in this uh, diagram included in yellow. And this is that's a Hordak softening curve you see. And with the orange line, it's it's yeah uh, similar to the the who could end fiber you just saw. So maybe follows some sort of root function. Um, and this, but you can see it's up to 1.5 in this diagram, but you can already see that um, between 0.1 millimeter and 0.3 millimeter, there's a yeah, small uh, dip um, or drop. Um, so if you would uh, yeah, simplify it, um, in this uh, graph, we are simplifying basically the red line, which was the concrete plus the steel fiber, uh, with just uh, a simplified input for the steel fiber reinforced concrete. So next to the uh, the uh, F, yeah, let's say the FFTS point, which was the stress at 0 0.5 millimeters, we would also like to induce a sort of a drop point or a, a point where, um, yeah, uh, as you can see, yeah, F, FT0, the point that you see uh, in the graph, a little bit above uh, one megapascal. Um, also, one other thing I would like to mention is that if we look at the uh, fracture energy of uh, just plain concrete, um, uh, which is highlighted in this with the, the yellow area, you can see that it is actually increasing slightly if we uh, apply uh, also steel fibers to it. So that means basically the first softening branch is also increased. So that's why it is mentioned that the fracture energy, at least the initial fracture energy of the first softening branch is uh, is in general a bit bigger than the uh, uh, yeah the softening branch of reinforced concrete. Uh, that's just one thing uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and if we then uh, continue, then uh, yeah, the full stress Seymour diagram or stress strain, which is related to it, will look something like this. Um, so what we actually see is indeed that we introduced, uh, or we propose to introduce some sort of uh, yeah, drop point or uh, FT0. Um, and yeah, the height of the, uh, the, the of that point should then be more or less related to the, the type of fiber you're going to use. Um, so what was now proposed for the uh, 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 constitutive model in the model code, uh, you can see that indeed uh, C prime is now introduced. Um, yeah, you don't you don't have to use it, but you can uh, use it in these, for example, for these hooker ten fibers. Um, also, uh, I think a note will be included, which says that indeed the pre-peak uh, hardening range AB can be neglected because it introduces uh, spurious energy dissipation. So you can just, uh, yeah, point A, you can just uh, basically extend up till the, uh, the tensile strength. Um, yeah, furthermore, you can see that point V is introduced, but basically point V can also be the same point as point D. And then it follows more the, the uh, the, the diagram which was uh, shown in the previous slide. Um, next up, we come to the, the second part, which is about uh, crack localization. Um, maybe good to mention also that uh, uh, the points C prime, um, that it was not also not only more uh, like a realistic uh, uh, stress strain diagram can be introduced, but it also can improve the crack localization. That's also uh, yeah an extra benefit of this uh, of this stress strain relationship. Um, yeah, in the second part of the presentation, uh, we're going to talk about crack localization in nonlinear fine element analysis and uh, why it is uh, important. Um, yeah, what will happen if you have poor crack localization uh, in your, yeah, of your cracks? Um, this could lead to uh, to a mesh dependent fine element analysis. Uh, you could get an overcapacity of the structure. Um, your uh, basically yeah, you're yeah, you're not not so 
it's less accurate how you can predict your failure mechanism. Um, and mainly you undershoot your crack width and you could face some convergence issues. Yeah, in the next uh, slides, I would like to discuss this example. Um, I'm not going too much into detail how it's all modeled and what kind of material input is used, uh, but it's, um, it's basically a slab on piles. Uh, in this case, uh, four piles, but we're using symmetry in, in two directions. So essentially this is just a quarter of the model. So that would, yeah, that would uh, be, I guess, a slab on 16 piles. And it's modeled with a combination of, at least the slab is uh, modeled with a combination of shell and solid elements. Um, the solid elements are now modeled above the piles uh, to capture the punching behavior because shell elements are not uh, capable of uh, capturing fully correctly the, the punching uh, behavior. Uh, furthermore, we're going to use uh, yeah, a similar material which was described as before, so uh, steel fiber reinforced concrete modeled with the total strength crack model uh, with a, yeah, a smeared crack approach. Then there's some uh, reinforcement in there and the loads is just self-weight with a uh, uniform distributed load. Um, yeah, uh, then in the, the reinforcement is shown on the right image. It's just, uh, I think, grid reinforcement uh, in the bottom of the slab and on the top of the slab Above the piles, there is extra, uh, yeah, bench bending uh, reinforcement at the at the top of the slab. And when we, uh, yeah, then perform the analysis, we can see that at the top of the floor, above the piles, when we uh, show the uh, the cracks, you can actually see that they're already quite nicely localized. Uh, however, if we look at the bottom of the slab, so that's mainly in the, in the like the shell regions, uh, also mainly the bending where the, where the uh, sagging moment is occurring, uh, you can see that the crack localization is actually quite poor. And if we zoom in on a little bit and also show the, the elements, uh, you can see that some of these cracks are actually smeared out over 10 elements uh, or eight elements. Uh, on the left side. Um, yeah, and this is actually uh, yeah, unwanted, uh, unwanted behavior for the reasons which were described earlier. Um, so I did a small investigation and in this uh, small investigation, I will compare uh, yeah, the difference in behavior of shell element and salt elements. And we're just going to apply uh, uh, yeah, a Q load. So we'll, it will give uh, uh, main, the main cross-sectional forces bending moment, and it will just be a statically determined structure. Um, and we're going to use steel fiber reinforced concrete with uh, some reinforcement uh, at the base. Um, so before continuing to the to the to the models. Um, I would like to explain a little bit about the input for the finite element analysis. And because the input for, you can input actually uh, uh, Indiana a, a stress uh, C mod uh, input or C mod. Um, but internally, Diana will transfer it to a stress train relationship, which is needed for our smooth crack approach. Um, so, as I said, it's, uh, we're using a stress train diagram. And with the aid of the characteristic length, the stress CMO diagram can be transferred to this stress strain diagram. And normally, uh, as Professor De Prisco explained in the previous presentation, um, this is based on what your estimated crack spacing is, yeah, crack spacing is, or uh, let's say uh, your cracked zone, for example, that was the, I think the Y. Um, However, this is for, for analytical models. And we are now uh, looking at the finite element model. Because what you're actually doing in an analytical model is that you calculate the strain over a cross section, but then you still have to smear it out over a certain length. And that length is the characteristic length in order to get the crack width. 
Uh, so usually that's the, the, the crack spacing or yeah, when there's only one crack, then that's the cracked zone. Um, however, for, for finite element models, the, the characteristic length is actually equal to the crack bandwidth. Uh, the reason for this is that we are going to uh, not smear out the entire strain over a crack spacing, but we're going to, yeah, we would like to only see it in one element. So we would localize, we would like to localize the strain in one element. Then we can just uh, yeah, make use of the crack bandwidth. And if we do it in, in that way, um, we can actually calculate the correct crack width in the end. And I will further uh, yeah, elaborate uh, on this in, in the next few slides. Um, so on the left side, you see the curved shell elements. And on the right side, you see the, uh, the solid elements. Um, as you can see, the shell elements are uh, loaded in the out of plane direction. So that means that uh, uh, yeah, the bending will occur also around, let's say, uh, the shell elements. And on the right side, you see the, the solid elements. Um, so first, uh, the results of the, uh, um, of the shell elements. Uh, on the left side, you see some displacement. Um, and on the right side, you see the, the bending moment. Well, the bending moment curve is just as you expect, because this is just a Q-load. Um, so then you would find, uh, for a statically determined structure, you will find this sort of bending moment shape. So because it's independent of the stiffness of the beam. Um, then on the left side, you see your uh, crack width, uh, the, the, yeah, which is strongly related, of course, to the strain, uh, only multiplied with the bandwidth. So also the strain would be smeared out as it's shown here. And on the right side, you see actually the curvature. Um, so the curvature is also a bit of a smooth line, but uh, not uh, completely identical as the shape of the bending moment. That's because uh, in the middle, uh, where the largest cracks are occurring, you see, of course, a reduction of the stiffness. And if you see a reduction of the stiffness, but the bending moment remains the same, then you will see an increase in the curvature. Um, yeah, that's basically also what you see in a typical moment curvature diagram. For this cross section, uh, you can make a, a yeah, a moment curvature diagram, which you see on the right bottom, um, which usually goes initially with a, a linear elastic uh, uh, branch. Then you see a small deviation, which is induced by the initial cracking. And then uh, it goes to a more flat part, which is initiated by the yielding of the reinforcement. And what you see is actually that for different points on your shell element, uh, the same moment curvature diagram will be uh, followed. And this is also expected because the strain distribution over the height, let's say, of your shell element, so in the out of plane direction, should always remain linear. Um, so then you will always find the same bending moment curvature diagram for yeah, all the points in your, uh, in your uh, shell uh, model. And on the left side, you can actually see that the stress strain relationship for all the points is nicely uh, respected because you can see that all the points are on the uh, black dashed line. And uh, yeah, the points of course connected with individual lines but they do not represent the actual behavior. But you can see that all the points are nicely uh, uh, on the stress strain uh, which has been used as input. Um, in the next slides, we're investigating the, uh, the solid model. Uh, what is good uh, to see is that in the right image, you see the exact same uh, bending shape um, as was expected since it's a statically determined structure. Um, however, in the, uh, in the yeah, where we now look at the cracks, you can see that the cracks are now nicely localized, which would also mean that the strains which are, uh, uh, are nicely localized automatically because they are related by the crank bandwidth. 
Um, and on the right side, you can actually see that at these locations of the cracks, that the curvature uh, is, is, is increased significantly. And between the cracks, you can see that the curvature is relatively low. Um, so initially for the shell, we explained that there's only one moment curvature diagram, uh, but for the solid elements, it, this doesn't apply anymore. That has to do with, uh, which we can also see here. Um, if you look at two points, so if you would look at uh, on the right side, you have your moment curvature diagram. Um, the orange line basically gives us the moment curvature relationship inside a crack. And the blue point uh, gives us uh, yeah, the relationship of the moment curvature diagram uh, between cracks. Um, what you can actually see is that it still remains relatively stiff. Um, um, yeah, and that the, actually the bending moment can actually increase uh, different than you, you initially expected. Um, and on the left side, you can see that Indeed, the blue line is actually the, the micro cracking where you see the unloading at some point of the cracks. Also on the left side, you can see that all the points are nicely uh, respecting the stress strain diagram, which was used as input. Um, yeah, to further explain the difference uh, of the, 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 the moment curvatures between the uh, stress strain in the crack and between the cracks. Um, I could plot the uh, stress, basically distribution over the cross section. You can see that on the left side, this, for, this is for an example, when we are looking inside the crack. Um, I hope it's a bit clear to see, but on the left side is the, the, the stress distribution. It's also, you can see it nicely follows the stress strain input we used for the model. And on the right side, you can see the, uh, the strain. Uh, and you can see that's actually still a linear distribution. Um, so the bending moment uh, at this uh, moment is 4.9 kilonewton meter, and the curvature is uh, something uh, about 2.8 uh, to the power minus two. If we then go to the next slide, we can see what is going on with the stress strain distribution between cracks. And you can see that the, uh, uh, the bending moment is exactly the same value, but you can see that the curvature is a lot smaller. And that can be obtained because of the fact that the strain distribution over the height is not linear anymore. Um, so because of this, we can actually get a higher bending moment or a similar bending moment with a, 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 with a curvature, which is a lot lower. Um, this, is, this helps us to, to yeah, get nicely localized cracks in one element. Um, so what we did next is to uh, also model the uh, sagging, uh, or at least where we expect the sagging moments. So those parts, we also model it uh, with solid elements uh, to get a better uh, crack localization. And if we do that, you can see the comparison between the shell elements and the solid elements. And you can actually see that the cracks are now nicely localized in one element. And you see clearly the, the crack spacing and the amount of cracks which were there. And you don't see any more these, that these cracks are smeared out over, uh, yeah, let's say eight to 10 elements. Because indeed, if the, if the cracks are smeared out over eight to 10 elements, then it doesn't really, uh, work anymore to just use the crack bandwidth. You want uh, the cracks to nicely occur in one element. So then uh, what we discussed earlier that for finite elements analysis we're using the crack bandwidth as the characteristic length is then also valid. Um, and I would like to quickly show uh, a, a second example of crack localization. Um, and that's typically for shrinkage. Um, in this model, we modeled a, uh, a small, basically slab of 30 meters. It's a slab on grade. Um, and on the left side, we have a symmetry axis. So 
technically the slab would be 60 meters long and we would uh, we're going to apply a, yeah, a shrinkage of 0 0.22 per meal and we're going to compare uh, um, yeah, the material without uh, a random field so that's just a yeah homogeneous approach let's go yeah let's put it like that and we're going to uh, run an analysis with the application of a random field uh, and see the, the difference. So if we would apply the shrinkage, we can see that the, uh, uh, the yeah, the, the slab is actually shortening, in this case, 4.3 millimeters. And on the right side, you can see very small cracks, which are not uh, localized yet or not at all. Um, and this is indeed if we assume that the that there's no uh, a difference in tensile capacity between elements, for example. So there's no random field applied. Um, in the next uh, slides, we are going to apply the random field. You can see that the shrinkage is now four uh, compared to the 4.3 in the previous slides. And you can see that there are uh, localized cracks occurring. And I think if you add those, the sizes of those cracks, you come to something like 0.3, which was the difference in, in displacement. Um, and that is now because the random field is applied uh, yeah, over, this, uh, over this slab. And the random field is applied basically over the entire stress strain relationship of the tensile side. So it's from, uh, I think, 0.95 up to 1.05. So maximum 5% uh, difference. Um, by taking this into account, you get a much more realistic crack pattern than uh, if you do not take it into account. Uh, that's that's uh, yeah this example. So then uh, quickly uh, summarize the uh, the things we just discussed. A uh, new constitutive model has been proposed for steel fiber reinforced concrete for a smeared crack approach. Uh, in this proposal, we advise to neglect the pre-peak hardening branch, the AB. Also, C prime has been introduced to describe a more realistic behavior for different type of fibers, and also to uh, improve crack localization. Uh, and in the second part of the uh, presentation, the, uh, uh, the importance of uh, localization has been highlighted, or crack localization. This explains how we can get a better crack localization and uh, yeah, in, that, in the first example, that was basically by using solid elements instead of the shell elements. And in the second uh, example, that this was achieved by performing a random field uh, over the, uh, the, the tensile behavior. And that's it. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Pim, for this nice bridge between the concepts and how to use this in the finite element models. Um, now there's some time for answering uh, questions. Um, there are some questions arriving uh, from our attendees. I will start with one uh, for Professor um, uh, Marco, that is regarding the, from, from Christian Hamm. Uh, regarding the partial coefficient of 1.5, there must be some requirement on the coefficient of variation of the residual strengths of the fibers for that to be valid. Also, the value of 1.5, uh, it should also include the model uncertainty. Uh, is there any documentation of that? Uh, I have not been able to find. Okay, thank you. Um... Denise, I would like to reply in this way. Um, obviously, uh, it's always very difficult to compute uh, the safety coefficient for the material. And in case of fiber and concrete, it's even more complex because uh, you mix uh, reinforcement with the conventional plain concrete. And that means uh, that uh, you could imagine something between uh, uh, 1.15 that we use for conventional reinforcement and 1.5 that we use for uh, compressive uh, behavior in concrete, which is very brittle. Um, the material in the pull-out mechanism is not so brittle. Uh, usually the pull-out uh, branch that we use for the equilibrium uh, 
uh, is uh, characterized by a much larger ductility with respect to the brittle behavior in compression for concrete. So um, we try to adjust uh, the results, taking into account also that in the um, classification of the material, we uh, strongly penalize the material uh, because we uh, use a, a notched uh, test. And uh, we know that uh, uh, selecting different type of uh, cross section, we can have uh, for a small size uh, corresponding to the uh, cross section that we are analyzing the bending test, uh, a huge scatter. So the best way to verify, in my opinion, uh, the reliability of the safety coefficient is to look to what you obtain at the end, uh, looking to a real beam. As I tried to show you before, the average safety coefficient that you have for uh, a conventional beam is more than six. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, uh, even the worst situation are always on the safe side with this selection. Take into account also that if you are not sure of the uh, orientation factor, um, you have to consider the orientation factor which corresponds to one uh, in, as a, pardon, the, uh, for, uh, for the case of the random distribution, you have to consider 0 0.5. That means uh, that you reduce of another factor of two, your final response. So really we usually have always a, a huge safety with respect to what we have uh, to consider in the reality, but uh, it's not so easy to uh, approach uh, the safety coefficient as usually we do when we have only one material, because fiber and post concrete is essentially a mix of two materials. And the mix is coupled by means of nonlinear behavior, which is bond. Thank you very much. I think it answers the question. I continue with uh, another question. I think it's more re related with the, the medical simulation uh, for PIM. Uh, Ka Kafi Aliu is asking, I'm wondering how to incorporate the contact effects from different fiber types in Diana for interfacial transition zone. Uh, yeah, not, uh, I'm not really sure because the interfacial transition zone, that's more about micro modeling, I assume. Um, and in this presentation, it was more about macro modeling. Uh, so it's a macro modeling approach. Uh, so it's, um, but of course, if you're going to yeah, model also uh, all the grains and things like that, um, and then you, and you come to some sort of basically interface uh, relationships between the fiber and the uh, and the surrounding paste. Um, I hope that sort of answers your yeah. question. I'm, I'm, yeah. uh, I, I have not so. really so much much experience with the, the macro modeling uh, of concrete, also with uh, steel fibers. But it's uh, an in interesting topic. Uh, yes, I think we can uh, continue. Another question about mm -hmm. uh, maybe Marco, do you know more about this? Or? Uh, uh, sorry, I was concentrated on another question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> never mind. I then. couldn't follow you perfectly. So, if you like, I can reply. But uh, please re resume the, what you wanted to say. No, I, I can add that we have a lot of information in our, at least in our um, uh, Diana documentation about interface modeling. I think this would be the way to micro model, uh, micro modeling, so modeling uh, explicitly all the fibers, the concrete. Ah, fiber. okay. No, I, I can yeah. say that it's yeah. a very, uh, we know that uh, because we, in the literature, we find a lot of this type of examples, but the problem is that, uh, uh, you can use uh, just for a qualitative response of the, of, the, of the structure, not for a quantitative one, because yeah. it's too complicated to start from that point. You have to consider too many parameters, and uh, please consider the fact that even now we are not able to model correctly the, uh, the, uh, the bond between the bar and the plain concrete, which is a completely different scale, and it should be much more simple. But in case of the fiber, you have the interaction of the fiber, you have different orienta orientation of the fiber, not exactly a perfect homogeneous distribution, too many parameters. And uh, it's uh, really only a, a 
a good exercise uh, to evaluate uh, perhaps uh, some special uh, uh, parameters uh, you can use uh, in, uh, uh, in the production of a special mix, but not uh, for a quantitative response, only for a qualitative response. That's uh, it's my experience. Now I'm looking to the another question. I don't know if you look uh, also in the chat. Yes, yes, I was I was following the, the, the order of appearance of the questions, but um, uh, the, Please, the next, go on. Okay, the next one is uh, also about the finite elements. Uh, for being, uh, did you use shell uh, element or solid element? Well, uh, how did you model longitudinal reinforcement in your beam model? Um, yeah, in the beam example, it was indeed a comparison between the shell elements, which were loaded out of plane, and the solid elements. That was a comparison, and the reinforcement was just modeled with simplified grid reinforcement. Um, that was just to keep the model as simple as it is. Um, normally, if you would like to get a better crack prediction, it's recommended to use bond slip reinforcement. Um, in that sense, which you can also in, do in Diana. And you have to model them as individual bars with a certain uh, bond slip behavior. For example, the one suggested by the by the FIP, by the model code. Um, that's another option. But in this case, I just uh, kept the model a bit simple to highlight the difference between the solid results and the shell results. Next question is, uh, when neglecting the pre-peak branch AB, uh, when you're saying to, to apply this uh, constitutive model in finite elements, do you extend the part OA or model point A to B? So it seems- No, like extend it. Uh, you extend it until, uh, yeah, you extend zero A, you extend it up to the, the crack, the, the, the tensile strength. So the first bench you just extend until the crack, sorry, the tensile strength, and then the rest shifts a little bit to the left. Although, uh, the, the of course, the Sorry, the CMOD at 0 0.5 remains at that position, and also for the CMOD 2.5 remains at that position. I ask everyone if, uh, please, uh, instead of using the chat, it's, re it's preferable if you, you can uh, put the questions in the QA. I I'm following uh, the chat also, but it's easier for our uh, administration here to follow the QA. Uh, so I continue here um, from uh, Aline. Uh, does increasing the number of integration points in a shell affect the crack localization? Um, no, not really, because the main point was to show that shells cannot describe um, the, strain, the, the, the strain distribution over the height is always linear. Um, and, and for solids, uh, when we look at the part where the micro cracking occurred, the strain distribution is not actually linear over the height. Uh, but with shell elements, we always assume that it's linear over the height. So the yeah, we can increase the number of integration points over the thickness, um, but that doesn't really help with the crack localization problem. Okay, so uh, now continuing with a question for Professor Marco from Chris Riemens. Um, in the beginning of the presentation, an example was shown where based on three point pending tests results, the characteristic values FRLK and FR1K and FR3K are deduced from the average values. Can you clarify how the characteristic values are exactly derived? Because I get different values. Uh, well, the, the expressions are in the shed. Um, so. I, I suppose that the, uh, the final question was already uh, solved by uh, a reader because I tried to, uh, to follow. And so especially uh, Christian Am already replied. But anyway, uh, the idea is that you have to distinguish two situations when you know the, uh, the scattering, the standard deviation where you don't know. We are using always uh, uh, the EN-9090 approach uh, with the unknown standard deviation, because we don't know in advance the standard deviation. So when you don't know the standard deviation, you have different values which are higher than what uh, uh, the uh, Chris Riemens suggested. So this is uh, the difference. 
Okay, continuing on that uh, question, uh, it says which sa which safety format you, you, would you recommend in design when using nonlinear finite element? This is this is a very difficult question uh, because we worked uh, uh, relatively recently about nonlinear behavior of this type of structures uh, uh, when you use for the design, of course. What I usually uh, believe is that uh, if you start from the characteristic values of your materials and you consider the, materi the, the global material homogeneous, uh, you can be always on the safe side. So uh, the best way is to uh, abandon the idea to have an average and then uh, try to adjust uh, after uh, with a different approach uh, the introduction of the standard deviation, but directly start from the characteristic value. In those cases, uh, you could be closer to the real situation. Of course, sometimes too much, but at the moment, this is the best that you can do. Um, for now, I have two more questions. Uh, first one here is about the influence of shrinkage. So Daniel is asking uh, regarding the crack width evaluation with finite element method. In scientific literature, there are different ideas regarding the effect of fibers amount regarding their influence to reduce the dry shrinkage deformation. Some study says that with high fiber amount, the shrinkage strains of the element reduces due to the constraint effect of the fibers. In the finite element analysis could be analyzed the effect of the fibers regarding the cracking due to shrinkage. Well, is it, uh, I'm not sure whether it also reduces the drying shrinkage deformation, um, but uh, what we usually see is indeed that we see more, more cracks, which are a bit smaller. Uh, if we use steel fiber reinforced concrete, and that does come out of the finite element models as well. Um, some study says that with high fiber amount, the shrinkage change of the element reduces due to the, yeah, that could be true. That is indeed, if you have higher fiber amount, that, that, that indeed, um, because the fibers do not shrink, uh, only the concrete shrinks. So it could be that uh, if you have a high amount of fibers, um, that your shrinkage will be less, but I'm not sure about it. And if you would like to analyze, uh, analyze this in a finite element model, yeah, you, you are looking really also again at micro uh, modeling. Uh, so you need to explicitly model the fibers and see what is the effect, uh, yeah of the fibers, are they actually constraining uh, the shrinkage of the concrete, uh, if that's the case? Okay, I think we can continue. There's a, there's a Duke uh, asking about uh, if we uh, compared, or if you been compared um, your results, uh, so you compared the computational finite element model with micro crack problems with other uh, softwares, uh, such as ANSYS and Abacus, uh, because it states that they can solve the issues of micro crack simulations better and even can show developing of local cracks and open cracks. Um, yeah, obviously I don't use other software than Diana since I work for Diana. Um, also, I'm not uh, known why would they describe micro cracks better. Um, I have no idea why, why that would be the case, but I can imagine the uh, stress strain relationship that we propose uh, obviously also works for other finite element programs. It's not related only for Diana. Um, is just a stress strain relationship. Uh, so I, I, I assume it will give similar results in Enzo's and Abacus. Um, yes, another question. Uh, is it possible to model randomly oriented and uniformly distributed fibers in fiber reinforced concrete in a finite element model? Um, yeah, what do you mean that? What do you would like to gain from it? Do you would like to gain that it, it behaves uh, different in different uh, parts of your or your uh, structure? Um, I think this is also possible in micro cracking, right? Like you have an algorithm. Yeah, obviously with micro cracking, you can position the fibers any way you like. Um, 
And for macro cacking, you are not generally taking this into account. You just assume uh, some sort of homogeneized uh, material uh, that you choose. And then over that, you can apply a random field if you need, if you need that. Um, but for a macro approach, you, do, you don't approach it in that way. But for a micro approach, you can, of course, model the fibers in any way you like and see what is the effect of that. Another question, uh, can we apply the model code 2010 for polymeric fibers, even if they creep? This is a good question. Um, we know that uh, uh, polymeric fibers are affected by a larger creep with respect to the steel fibers. Um, at the moment, uh, uh, what we believe is that uh, the creep uh, in any case uh, uh, cannot change too much uh, the final structural response of the structure. Uh, we tried to analyze different situation and we never uh, observed a huge influence on the final response. Um, but of course, uh, we put on a warning in the model code uh, because uh, uh, I think that it depends on the problem. So uh, usually uh, you could do and you can neglect, uh, but uh, not always. And so you have to analyze a single problem. Um, I think, well, uh, we addressed most of the, the questions. Uh, um, there's the question of if, if people will uh, be, uh, if you, we will have, um, uh, we can see the recording uh, of the presentation. Um, I think you can be, we'll be contacted by uh, FIB um, uh, about this. Um, and, uh, Yes, it says yes, yes, yes in our social media. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think with this, we, we, we can uh, close uh, this very interesting uh, webinar, putting together FIB and Diana FEA, uh, making the bridge also from university to applied finite element models. Uh, it's always very interesting to see how this could, we can work together. Uh, I want to thank you again, uh, the lecturers, the participants, uh, and um, with this, I will end the webinar. And uh, thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye to everybody. Goodbye.